So these different factors are letting us know that there's so much more that comes with brain function rather than just taking a snapshot of the brain at any particular time of day and comparing that to other brains. Uh, we need to get much more specified on the actual individual and create uh, rich data sets for the individual. Hey all you neurohackers, welcome to Tech for Psych where we combine ancient wisdom with the latest in neurotechnology to supercharge your brain. I'm Dr. Cody Rawl, your medical doctor confidant. So today I wanted to make the argument that mobile wearable technology is the only way that we're going to advance the field of neuroscience. I think that we'll still have laboratory experiments going on and I understand that that's quite crucial and that it is very difficult to have good scientific experiments when you get into the dynamics of the real world, but we must orient our focus in a lot of our scientific studies on the level of the individual. And I say this because I read a recent article uh, in the American Journal of Psychiatry as well as some other literature that has been taking a look at the history of brain imaging and making uh, conclusions based on our last 35 years of research and where we should go in the future. And as you know, I review a lot of devices. Here's the Emotive Insight, here's the Muse headband. And these companies have uh, amazingly paved this whole new route of neuroscience research that can take place through consumer grade technology. No longer is the EEG technology just limited to the laboratories of research institutions or academic institutions. Now it's in the hands of the general consumer who can contribute to neuroscience research in ways that they've never been able to do before. So in this article and other research that I've been reading lately, I really rehashed this uh, history of the last 35 years or so of uh, brain imaging research. And what I'm talking about is in the mid 1970s, they had positron emission tomography come online. Now, uh, what they did was use radio ligands to actually figure out where receptors were in the brain and really spawned the whole era of understanding how to make different medications, what brain receptors they bind to and what effects that has on the person that's taking it. And that really led to all the different designer drugs in psychiatry like Prozac or Effexor or any of these other medications that you hear about. So, you know, you had positron emission tomography for some time and what was really difficult about that technology is that people actually had to be injected with these radio ligands, exposing them to radiation. So obviously you don't want them to have to go through that study uh, more than once or twice in order to contribute to the scientific study just because it's just not generally very good for your health. So it actually very limited the uh, subject size of these studies. Uh, later on, functional MRI came up and running in the 90s and 2000s, but even then sample sizes were limited to about 20 people. And it's very difficult to determine biomarkers from that amount of data set. Meaning that if you're looking for a, a biomarker, a, a brain scan that represents depression or a brain scan that represents anxiety or a brain scan that represents a high performer or high meditator, um, it's really difficult to do that with very few data sets, meaning that each person's brain scan is a data set. So you pull together 20 people's brain scans and see if they uh, link up with like a diagnosis of depression or if they are normal in a control group and figure out the differences between those. So what happened in the 90s and 2000s and now in the, into the 2010s is that uh, brain scanning technology actually became much cheaper and more accessible. And what happened there is that rather than just having 20 people in a data set size, now we have giant projects like the Human Connectome Project where people can take sample sets from 4,000 people and have a very robust study from that. Uh, so that's really been the, the story of brain imaging in the last 30 to 40 years. So now that we have these very robust data sets, you can apply things like machine learning to figure out, okay, if these people had a diagnosis of depression and these people were, uh, you know, uh, characterized as uh, normal control, what is the difference between the brain scans of depression and a normal control? And we are definitely were able to find some uh, trends, but it's very difficult to find a biomarker that would be reliable in actually being able to diagnose someone with depression simply from the brain scan itself. Or what's actually really important here is tracking improvements in the brain structure from different treatments, whether that be talk therapy, whether that be meditation, exercise, whether that be a medication, 
or different treatments that we have coming online like TMS. So in order to figure out if our treatments are actually helping people rather than just going from their word of mouth, it would be helpful to actually get biomarkers in order to understand what exactly we're trying to do here with neuroscience. And like I said before, it's very difficult to do with small data sets and now we've com uh, compared larger data sets of people and still have a lot of work to do. And what this article was arguing is that, um, you know, it seems like we should have better biotypes and biomarkers now than we actually have. And genetics have actually run into the same problem. Um, probably for genetics, the difficulty comes with epigenetics, meaning that the genetics are the different chromosomes are being turned on and off throughout the day, throughout the month, throughout the year, and affecting how these genes are actually expressing themselves to actually create the phenotype. So phenotype is the actual expression of the genetic material. Um, phenotype could be um, the shape of your hands or the color of your eyes or, or even things as complex as behaviors. And those are being actually expressed from the genotype, meaning the code in the DNA, but it takes a lot to get from the code of the DNA out to actually the phenotypic expression. Well, the same thing happens in the brain, meaning that the actual anatomical structure of the brain is only the beginning of the expression of emotion and behavior or complex things like bipolar disorder or schizophrenia, meaning that it's the anatomical structure is only a part of the actual overall picture. It's the expression of that. And the expression of that is through brain function that we can see through electroencephalography, like uh, these devices track, or more fancy uh, measures like functional MRI, in which you actually have to be in a MRI machine to track the blood flow changes in the brain from moment to moment to see that expression of um, brain activity to get functional MRI. So what we've done is compare people's different functional MRIs to each other in order to find biotypes. Uh, but the problem with that is that we're learning the expression of the brain activity is so different all throughout the day. And we really need to orient a lot of our studies to the level of the individual, meaning that we need data sets to actually track the brain function throughout the day. And what is so interesting about this consumer electronic industry, like Muse being a uh, platform for research, is they have these huge data sets for people from multiple different types of uh, times of the day, different genders, different ages, and they've been able to find findings in neuroscience that have never been described before. There's this thing called alpha band power that uh, Dr. Graham Moffat talks about that they actually see changes in alpha peak frequency according to age. They were able to find other EEG markers that actually changed depending on what gender you were, uh, depending on what age you were, and even uh, what time of day you actually use the technology. So these different factors are letting us know that there's so much more that comes with brain function rather than just taking a snapshot of the brain at any particular time of day and comparing that to other brains. Uh, we need to get much more specified on the actual individual and create uh, rich data sets for the individual. And what was so cool about this article in this very nice and prestigious academic journal is um, you know, not only were they talking about functional MRI needed to make this shift, but EEG, these consumer grade uh, EEG devices, actually having a renaissance because there can be great reproducible findings from these uh, EEG devices and EEG actually can um, create these biomarkers. Um, a good example is Dr. Craig Olson's work at a University of Victoria who, who I interviewed a couple of months ago who is actually using EEG to measure cognitive fatigue. So you can use that uh, with a oddball paradigm on a tablet and have the device on having it track your reaction times simply from the brain waves alone and create something called an evoke related potential and using that to determine your level of cognitive fatigue. And they're actually using that uh, with NASA for the Mars research program out there in Hawaii right now. So um, when you put all this together, like, okay, we need to focus on the individual. We need to see different uh, changes throughout the day. We need a lot more data. That's why I say wearables are the way to go because um, you know I think there's just gonna be so much things that we haven't seen before when it comes to incorporating this technology into clothes. Like for example, Muse has actually created Smith Lowdown Focus Glasses where they have EEG and a pair of sunglasses that you could wear throughout the day. 
uh, Mary Lou Jepsen's working on a ski cap where you would have near infrared spectroscopy that you could track brain function throughout the day. Uh, there's just a whole slew of different neurotechnology products coming out on the consumer side that they can actually use for research. Going back to Muse, uh, they're actually developing programs that you can download on your app and take uh, part in neuroscience studies. You could actually go through like an oddball paradigm test or other tests and have the Muse track your brainwaves and help them contribute to neuroscience research in a way that's never been done before. So in order to advance our overall neurotechnology prow prowess, we actually need to turn to the consumer side because only on the consumer side are they gonna be able to get enough devices out there to the general population and have them use them uh, in and out throughout the day in order to get big data sets that we can apply to machine learning and learn more and more things about the brain so that we can achieve our dreams of you know, doing brain computer interface like Elon Musk is working on right now with Neuralink. Um, uh, be able to get even better neural feedback programs to improve our ability to engage in meditation and other cognitive exercises and have uh, machines literally teach us how to do that. And then, um, you know, do things like improve our diagnostic capabilities in fields like psychiatry where people are maybe coming down with schizophrenia and you can take a brain scan and see here's your risk factors and, you know, be able to give them treatments that didn't have side effects that could actually reverse those effects and have them live a long and meaningful, fruitful life. So, that, so that's all I had for you today. I just want to express my enthusiasm one more time for this mobile neurofeedback technology and appreciate so much everybody that's been watching my videos and engaging in this collective process. I know Emotive has a whole page of uh, people that are doing neuroscience research with their products and I know Muse is working on their own research right now. We've got the Muse Facebook community of people sharing their individual brainwaves with meditation and just learning from each other. What I want you guys to do right now is check out my video with Dr. Krieg Olson talking about uh, what I alluded to in this video in which they use the Muse headband to track cognitive fatigue through uh, vocal related potentials. So go to that video right now and check out Dr. Krieg Olson. He's so awesome to listen to. I'll see you next in the next video.